In this video lesson, we'll discuss the corrupt bargain and the election of 1824. We'll discuss the presidency of John Quincy Adams and the rise of the Jacksonian era. As James Monroe, the last of the Virginia dynasty, completed his second term, there were four candidates present in the election of 1824. John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, Henry Clay of Kentucky, William H. Crawford of Georgia, and Andrew Jackson of Tennessee. All four rivals professed to be Republicans, but well-organized parties had not yet emerged, and there was still only one political party. And John C. Calhoun was a vice presidential candidate to both Adams and Jackson. The results of the campaign were interesting, but also very confusing. Andrew Jackson, who was the war hero from the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812, clearly had the strongest personal appeal, especially in the West where he was from, and he campaigned against corruption and against privilege in government. Jackson polled as many popular votes as his next two rivals combined, but he failed to win a clear majority of electoral votes. In a deadlock such as this, it is the duty of the House of Representatives, as described by the Twelfth Amendment, to choose among the top three candidates, and Clay was eliminated, but as Speaker, he presided over the House. The influential Henry Clay was in a position to throw the election to the candidate of his choice, and he reached his decision by process of elimination. Crawford, recently felled because of a paralytic stroke, was out of the picture because he was unwell and not fit to be president. Clay hated the military chieftain Andrew Jackson, his arch rival for allegiance to the West, and in turn, Jackson bitterly resented Clay's public denunciation of his Florida attack. The only candidate left was Adams, with whom Clay had never established a cordial personal relations but the two men were common politically and both believed in nationalism and were advocates of the American system. Shortly before the final balloting in the House, Clay met privately with Adams and assured him of his support, and when decision day came in early 1825, largely thank you, thanks to Clay, John Quincy Adams was elected president. So even though in the original election of 1824, Andrew Jackson clearly won the popular vote. He did not win a majority of the electoral vote, which is what caused the election to go back to the House of Representatives for them to be able to decide the election. So in this case, this election is very similar to the election of 2000, where Al Gore won the popular vote and George Bush won the electoral vote and was eventually elected president by the House of Representatives. A few days later, Adams announced that Henry Clay would be the new Secretary of State, so it certainly seemed like there had been a bargain that had been made under the table. This was called the Corrupt Bargain of 1824. The Office of Secretary of State was a coveted position because it was a stepping stone into the presidency. By allegedly dangling the position as a bribe before Clay and Adams, the second choice of the people, apparently had defeated Jackson. Masses of angry Jacksonians, people who supported Andrew Jackson, raised a roar of protest against this corrupt bargain, and Jackson condemned Clay as a Judas of the West. John Quincy Adams was then forced into a presidency that was overshadowed by this corrupt bargain. He was an irritable man, a sarcastic man, somewhat tactless, but a very honorable man. He entered the White House under charges of the bargain and corruption and usurpation. He was the first minority president, a president who was elected by not the majority of the common people. Adams achieved high office by commanding respect rather than counting pop or courting popularity. While Adams's enemies accused him of striking a corrupt bargain, his political allies wished that he would strike a few more, but Adams resolutely declined to oust efficient officeholders in order to create vacancies for his supporters. 
Adam has, Adams had very nationalistic views, which gave him further trouble. Much of the nation was turning away from nationalism and more towards states' rights and towards sectionalism. Adams swam against the tide and urged Congress, upon his first annual, first annual message, to begin the construction of roads and canals and renewed Washington's proposal for a national university and advocated federal support for an astronomical observatory. Public reaction to these policies was prompt and unfavorable, especially in the South. If the federal government should take on heavy financial burdens, the South would have had to contribute to the hate of tariff duties to pay for its debt. Adams' land policy antagonized the Westerners, who clamored for wide open expansion and resented the President's well-meaning attempts to curb speculation in the public domain. And the fate of the Cherokee Indians brings about bitterness as well. The Georgia governor, by threatening to resort to arms, resisted the efforts of Washington's government to interpose federal authority on behalf of the Cherokees. So none of Adams's policies were resonating well with the American people because, especially in the South, people did not want to contribute to pay more into a tariff. Meanwhile, Andrew Jackson plans to run in 1828 for president, and he had been actively campaigning since the election of 1824 he felt was stolen from him. The presidential campaign for Andrew Jackson started very early in 1825, the day that John Quincy Adams was actually elected, and continued on for the entirety of John Quincy Adams' presidency. Even before the election of 1828, the temporarily united Republicans of the era of good feelings had split into two camps, the National Republicans supporting Adams and the Democratic Republicans supporting Andrew Jackson as their lead. Rallying cries of the Jackson zealots were bargain and corruption, huzzah for Jackson, and all hail old Hickory, which was Jackson's nickname. Jacksonites planted Hickory poles for their hero. Adamsites adopted the oak as the symbol for their oakenly independent candidate. Jackson's followers presented their hero as a frontiersman and a stalwart champion of the common man and denounced Adams as a corrupt aristocrat and argued that the will of the people had been thwarted in 1825 by the bargain between Adams and Henry Clay. Much of this talk was politically hyperbo political hyperbole as Jackson was actually very wealthy, and Adams, though perhaps an aristocrat, was far from corrupt, and he had very high puritanical feelings about how he was acting in his administration. Mudslinging reaches new lows in 1828, and the electorate developed a taste for bare-knuckle politics. Adams would not stoop to gutter tactics, but people who backed him did. Criticism of Adams was directed at the federal salary Adams had received over time. On voting day, the electorate split on very sectional lines. Jackson's strongest support came from the West and the South. The middle states in the Old Northwest were divided, and Adams won the backing of his own New England, where he was from, and the better elements of the Northeast part of the United States, areas where people um, were wealthier. But when the popular vote was converted to electoral votes, General Jackson's triumph could not be denied, as Adams was beaten by the electoral count of 178 to 83 making John Quincy Adams a one-term president. Although a considerable part of Jackson's support was lined up particularly in New York and Pennsylvania, the political center of gravity had clearly shifted away from the conservative eastern seaboard and towards the emerging states across the mountain. And we'll discuss the election of 1824 and the election of Jackson in 1828 in further detail in class. <music>